All right, let's talk about um, the other person in the, the other major party. Say a little something about Hillary Clinton. I actually don't, I have no idea what she's even saying in her speeches because I don't watch them. I don't watch them. I'm sure you have not watched a Hillary Clinton speech. Um, and I'd love to say I sat down and watched one for you, but, you know, the Mises Institute couldn't possibly pay me enough to do that. <laughs> so I went to her website. Oh, I went to her website. <laughs> yeah. We have this filtering software so the kids don't do anything bad on the internet. And this is going to come up in the reports. You know, you went to the HillaryClinton.com website. And I'll have to say, no, that wasn't the kids. That was me. I, I, I went to the Hillary Clinton website. So I just thought, all right, let's just see what she's saying, what's she talking about. Now, the thing is, you have to bear in mind, you can't always assume that what they say they're going to do is what they're going to do. I mean, to some extent, she's probably just trying to get some of the Bernie Sanders voters. But on the other hand, don't ever forget Horton's Law. Horton's Law, you know, please write this down, it's from 1840. I made that up. It's from like 2016. <laughs> it's my friend Scott Horton, who comes on my show a lot. Horton's Law is that, and, and I defy you to find an exception to Horton's Law, apodictically true. It is that when a politician makes promises, you can be certain he will keep all the bad ones and forget about all the good ones. Okay, so when Hillary Clinton promises she's going to do these things, I pretty much take her word for it. Okay, so for example, she wants to raise the minimum wage. Now we're all tired of hearing about the minimum wage; it's been argued to death, right? Not me. I could talk about it forever, but I mean, most people, they're tired of hearing about it. And because we we have been on the defensive a little bit, we opponents of the minimum wage, because the argument has been, don't you know about all the empirical studies that have shown that the minimum wage doesn't cause job losses? All right. Well, Bob knows all the literature on that. You can badger him the rest of the week about that. I've had him on to talk about it. And just one of the zillion points you can make is that when you're talking to these people who want to raise the minimum wage to $15, that's a more than 100% increase. None of these studies they're citing have had, were dealing with anything like a hundred percent increase in the minimum wage. None. So, so none of them even apply to this whole fight for fifteen thing. Now, I I don't know that Hillary Clinton has come out expressly for fight for fifteen. What I do know is I saw a Facebook meme. This is where I get a lot of my news, by the way. <laughs> I saw a Facebook meme with a young woman holding a a megaphone outside of McDonald's. And the quotation beneath her reads as follows. I have worked at McDonald's for eight years and never gotten a raise. That's why I fight for 15. All right, now let's, we're going to take that apart. <laughs> Here is my translation of that. You ready? I've worked at an entry-level job for eight years. <laughs> and haven't gotten a raise. Also, during that eight years, I haven't been able to find a single solitary employer willing to pay me one dime more. So you'd think I'd at least appreciate the one place on earth willing to employ me, but instead I'm shouting through this bullhorn. I'm gonna continue, oh, good. <laughs> The person continues. A raise is a human right. Therefore, I am calling in the goons who will hold a gun to my employer's head until I get paid $15 an hour, an amount not a single solitary person anywhere on earth has ever been willing to pay me voluntarily. That's why I fight for 15. That's what that really means. And when you think of it that way, it's suddenly you think, eh, something kind of fishy about this. Okay. Now, with the minimum wage thing, you can go through and talk about how few people actually earn the minimum wage, how unusual it is to be earning the minimum wage for longer than a year, much less eight years at McDonald's, and you've had eight years to look for alternative kinds of employment. Eight years. And you live in the age of Udemy, where you can learn an online skill in like a week, and you find nothing? All right, now I'm just riffing. I got to stop this. All right. So we got the, she wants to raise the minimum wage. Now, the minimum wage point was amplified, I think, with an, with an additional excellent argument in May at the Mises Institute event in Seattle by good old Walter, who says, look, on the one hand, they tell us we've got to send money to all these poor countries. But on the other, 
Why don't we just tell those countries, hey, just raise your minimum wage? <laughs> yeah. I, I put a meme with that on it up on my Facebook page. It got almost half a million views because people were sharing that thing like crazy because they realized, yeah, I guess that's right. Yeah, if it were that easy, we would just, yes, that's right. And in fact, when you look at the entire Clinton program, it's all, we want more of this, we want more of that, we want more of that. And so it just suffices to keep demanding and demanding and demanding more of the private sector. So the private sector gets ever narrower and narrower. The demands begin to flower. The base supporting all these demands gets ever narrower and narrower and narrower. That's, that's it. I mean, that's the, that is where statism takes you. All right, then she says, labor unions are essential to a free society. Oh my gosh, is she ringing a bell for a train that's gone 50 years ago? I mean, I don't know if you ring a bell for trains, but it sounded good. <laughs> I mean, labor unions are dead and gone. They are dead and gone, except in the public sector. But they're dead and gone, because you're, you're either going to have international trade or you're going to have labor unions. Uh, you're either going to have affordable goods or you're going to have labor unions. Now, look, I can say this as somebody whose father was a teamster for 15 years. So I guess a Marxist would say I am suffering from false consciousness because I'm supposed to support the labor unions because my father was in one. A pure Marxist, of course, has no patience for labor unions. But the labor union is one of these phantom, phantoms of the textbook that is sort of expected to bear a tremendous amount of explanatory power when it comes to explaining, for example, why the American standard of living has been so high in the 20th century, why it must be because of labor unions. The trouble with this is, and I have a little bit, I think I have a little bit on this in my 33 questions book. That, that book has such a terrible title, I'm not even gonna tell you the title, it's so terrible. Just type 33 questions in Woods and you'll find it. But in there, I talk a little bit about this, and it turns out that in the 19, uh, let's see, well, through, through the whole 20th century, the whole history of the 20th century, labor unions never got to up to more than about a third of the labor force was, was unionized. So it'd be, it's a little hard to explain rising wages when only at most a third, and that was only at its peak of these people were in fact uh, unionized. But by the 1920s, the, the, uh, if you look at the United States versus Europe, Europe was much more heavily unionized than the US and yet American wages were higher Americans were able to get uh, lower hours uh, that they wanted sooner than Europeans were. So there are some uh, factors here. But we think about what exactly happens with a labor union. Uh, uh, you have to think about, here you have, there, there are two parties in the textbook version of the labor union. There's the employer and there are union workers. Now there's a third party that's being left out. Isn't that the truth of all of life, right? The third party being left out. So you got the two parties, the employer and the employee, the, the union employee. But I'm gonna show you about this third group because the third group kind of is the key to the whole thing as it turns out. The labor union workers are not knocking on the door and saying, dear Mr. Employer, sir, uh, we've humbly assembled a petition of signatures because we believe that uh, conditions and wages ought to be improved. Instead, what happens, or certainly what happened in, in much of the 20th century when labor unions were, were uh, more powerful, was that violence would be used and destruction would take place. And if you wanted to go in and say, well, you know, I will accept the terms being offered by this employer, well, you would be beaten up, uh, kicked in the head. Uh, we have cases, uh, high profile, late 19th century cases where non-union workers' homes were actually blown up with dynamite. Um, so that part of the story generally doesn't show up in your, in your textbook. They talk about, you learn, you memorize the name Samuel Gompers, and you write down American Federation of Labor, but you don't learn about people having their limbs blown off, or brickbats being hurled at people, or broken glass, because then the story isn't quite as much fun to tell. So that's just out. So what in fact does happen? through intimidation of one form or another, and the, com well, let's, let's, let's face it, I mean, the, the state is conniving at this because the state's police will not intervene to stop what's going on. So they get the employer to raise the wage. But what does that mean? What do we know about economics, right? They're gonna raise the wage, they're gonna hire fewer people. That's what the union wants. They, they want to exclude. 
They want their people employed and to heck with everybody else. And the everybody else turns out to be that third party I was referring to. What happens to those people? Well, those people are dehumanized because they're called scabs. You know, scab is like the nice word for them. These people are scabs. And they're even referred to when your textbook will deign to mention them, sometimes use the term scabs. And you would think they would think that was kind of a dehumanizing word to use to refer to working people. But these working people are to be despised and ridiculed and dismissed. So where do these people go? Well, now they have to, maybe they're just locked out of that industry. They got to go somewhere else. And now here's the, here's the key point. First, we have the inefficiency involved that naturally we need the, we should be having more people working in this industry, but we don't. But a lot of these people were trained to work in that industry, and now they've been shut out. Because for labor unions to be able to keep the wage that high, they got to exclude people. They got to create an artificial scarcity. So where do the excess go? They go down a level. They go to a level of, of employment that's less desirable. So you see, when we follow the non-union people, we see, wait a minute, there's another side to this story. So not only are these people in less desirable employment, but now there's a lot of people there pushing wage rates down. But secondly, those people now don't get to use the skills that they train to learn because they've been excluded from the industry that they belong in. So all that training was a waste. So there's, there's, all, there's all kinds of deadweight losses, not to mention the union rules that are in effect that are basically meant to make work as inefficient as possible. Like there'll be a guy who, you know, let's say you got a lecture hall and that lecture hall is unionized. So if, if you need to turn the cassette tape over in the old days of cassette tapes, you'd have to wait, get the union guy to come in. He would turn the cassette tape over and then leave. I mean, it would bizarre, multiply that by 50,000. That's what you're dealing with, with the union work rules. So it turns out this is not good. This is not actually good. That the way wages rise is the opposite of this. Wages rose in the U.S. despite the fact that the U.S. was very, very little unionized compared to other countries. Wages rise because profits are invested in capital goods, which mean that you can be more physically productive in your economy, and the greater physical production puts downward pressure on prices, and then the workers' uh, check, um, paycheck can go farther. That's what does it. Again, it just happens. It happens through the natural orderly development of society and the economy. You don't, you don't actually need the goons, it turns out. Isn't that great? You'd think people would be happy about this. Society can be run without the initiation of violence. You'd think people would be happy about this. And then when you try to tell them, it's like you're telling them, we're going to rip the hearts out of cats just for fun. <laughs> you, you would think people would be delighted to hear this. I didn't realize we could run society this way. And you know, the funny thing is, they're not. They're not delighted that way. 